Hi there, and welcome to Plant CEO. In today's episode, I'd like to welcome Melanie, the CEO of Ananas Anam and the maker of Pinatext. Hi, Melanie, how are you doing? Hello, Anand. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to get you on the show today, uh, especially if we're, you know, talking about our, our favorite fruit, uh, the pineapple here, um, <laughs> which is awesome. And, and just to start with, have you ever tried grilled pineapple on a barbecue with a bit of cinnamon? No, but I look forward to trying that this yeah. summer. <laughs> so, so my neighbor made some, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when we had a barbecue. Obviously, you know, I'm vegan and... Uh, yeah, loved it. So it's my favourite fruit, uh, also to put on on pizzas. So it's it's awesome to talk to you today about these uh, alternative uses that you've come up with. So yeah, super excited to get you on the show. Great, looking forward to it. <laughs> so can we start um, by telling me um, about the origins of uh, the company uh, and how you created uh, Pinatex to what it is today? Yeah, sure. Um, so. First of all, Pinatex has been um, created, it's really the brainchild of um, Dr. Carmen Hirosa, um, so a Spanish um, lady who has um, actually been working in the leather industry all her life. So she had her own, you know, leather um, uh, brand and accessories and bags. And, and then further on later, um, she, she was consulting um, and she uh, worked for you know, different, um, you know, different missions all over the world. And um, one of her consultancy missions brought her to the Philippines, uh, the Philippine Design Center. And while working there, um, she really, you know, discovered the, you know, working conditions back then in the tanneries. And, you know, it was, you know, about 20 years ago, and even, you know, a lot of progress has been made since then, um, of course, in terms of, you know, working conditions and, and you know, environmental impact of tanneries. Back then, it was kind of not as, you know, improved as it was today. So that triggered kind of her thoughts about, could we not find a way uh, to create a leather-like material um, that is obviously, you know, providing better working conditions um, for the workers there, uh, but also another important aspect, um, providing a positive social impact um, using a raw material that is available in abundance in the Philippines, which is the um, pineapple leaf of the plant. Um, because you know, the Philippines is um, one of the top three um, you know, growing countries for pineapples in the world. Right. And, um, you know, after pineapple is harvested, um, the leaves of the plant actually um, are waste. Yeah. And, so, and let's let's just clarify that. So it's not yeah. not the top part of the leaves that you're talking about. It's actually the plant at the bottom before before it sort of fruits. But yeah. And that might have like 30 to 40 long leaves. Right. Um, absolutely. Yes. Right. So, so it's, you know, uh, long leaves in the plant and and you know after you know two cycles of, of you know um, growing the fruit and once it has been harvested um, the plants are actually um, waste so there are several possibilities either it's left to rot on the soil or even worse it's burnt which obviously releases a lot of you know um, CO2 and other uh, you know uh, harmful substances um, and so so this is kind of what triggered this you know um, uh, question what if what if we could use um, all that waste and um, you know and then do something out of it um, that would not only you know create um, and generate an economic opportunity but also having a huge social impact and a very low environmental footprint um, and also important to mention is you know the inspiration came from another side as well is that in the Philippines, the pineapple leaf fibers have already been used for you know, centuries um, for their traditional costume, which is called the baron, and it's used you know, for, for weddings and it's you know, worn by men and women. Um, and it's a very delicate um, you know, fabric. It's, it's like very delicate linen um, that is really hand woven. And so it's a really manual extraction process, very delicate and very you know, expensive. And, and so again, the idea was, okay, maybe we could use these, these fantastic fibers 
and, and find a way to industrialize a process um, that creates, you know, a sort of like a, a you know, material that's like, you know, skin, like almost like a leather um, that could not only bring this, you know, economic opportunity to, you know, um, the farmers in the Philippines, uh, but then also kind of, you know, sort plenty, plenty of other problems as well. So that was really the original outset. Why, you know, how the idea of opinion ethics came. Yeah. And what do you think is, is the main reason that we should be looking at alternative uh, choices uh, uh, instead of traditional forms of leather? Yeah, I mean, um, I think, you know, how, how, you know, how things evolve now, we would say, you know, 20 years later, um, is that the, the context has, is, has changed a lot. You know, there's this much higher awareness for, you know, about climate change, um, also the understanding of, you know, even though leather is a byproduct of, of the meat industry, um, the fact is that the meat industry, you know, is obviously, you know, using a lot of natural resources and actually too much to sustain it. Um, with the actual growth of the population. Um, and, you know, a lot of reports and, you know, if you, if you read, um, you know, I mean, many, many stats and, and you know, um, uh, studies um, anticipate that, you know, the consumption of meat will reduce drastically. And I think the US, first of all, a vegan, but also with all the vegan, um, you know, podcasts you've done in the, in the vegan food industry, I, I guess you can only confirm that, um, veganism is really on the rise. So, so meat consumption will reduce drastically um, in the next 10 years. And, and today, I think that the what if question is, um, you know, leather will become probably a niche, a luxury product. You know, leather will always be leather. And, and as long as there's any meat eaters, it's very good to use this as a byproduct because, you know, again, the whole point is to, to not to waste anything. But it will just be very, very small niche. And however, people will still need, you know, material to, to bring shoes and bags and, uh, you know, coverings or seatings. So, so we have to find alternative solutions to that. And, you know, Pinatex, I would say, you know, was launched in back in 2016. So it was literally, you know, one of the pioneers in terms of, you know, um, you know, naturally made alternative, you know, um, and, you know, since then there have been new actors coming into the market, which is fantastic. And I think all together, you know, um, you know, we have to bring a viable, scalable solution um, to replace leather simply because it will almost, you know, not be there anymore in the next 10 years. Yeah. If you're looking at the the leather market in general, where where, um, where does its usages uh, go in terms of the different types of products that get created from it? Yes, so um, almost fifty percent of you know um, leather production actually goes into the footwear industry. Um, then the second biggest market is actually the automotive industry with about seventy percent. Um, and then kind of very equal parts is, you know, bags and accessories, about 12%. Uh, and then, you know, you've got um, about 10% in, in, in garments, you know, like leather jackets. Um, and then a very tiny um, last one. I mean, then upholstery, of course, as well. And then, uh, and then gloss, which is kind of a tiny 4%. So, so that's roughly that footwear is really the brand of the usage of leather today. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the reason that you've been also focusing a lot in terms of your, your clients that you work with in the footwear market. Is that, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. So <clears throat> I would say, as always, it's, it's um, you know, we're, we're on a long journey. So, um, you know, it has started, you know, 20 years ago with Carmen really having this idea and then, you know, developing PNATX. And, and um, we, we are into the long run. So, you know, and, and obviously all we do is, um, you know, obviously, you know, try a lot and, and, you know, experiment all the possible applications we can go into. And I must say, you know, I, mean, I joined three years ago and I'm always amazed to see all the incredible applications PNATX has already been used for, which is really, really inspiring. Yeah. Um, but, can you but talk some, about some of those? 
Yeah, I mean, it could be anything. I come up, you know, um, uh, you know, accessories for even for dogs, you know, because if you think about, you know, why would you use an animal product for, for your own pets, you know, wow. so it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, like for uh, just recently, a brand launched there for um, you know, a, a bicycle, um, you know, the, the, the seat um, cover, you know, and then plenty exactly. of, um, you know, wonderful uh, garments as well, outerwear and, you um, uh, you know, and then uh, decorations for, you know, um, like, you know, printed wall panels, which absolutely looks magnificent because you can print very well on pin effects as well. Right. So, you know, there's no limit to, to creativity and how yeah. to use it. I'm glad uh, cycling brands uh, pick, is actually something that I look at, to be honest. Okay. Like, uh, bicycle seats is like, oh, do, do I want to sit on that or not? It's like you know, one of those things. But yes. do you want to talk about some of your 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 big brands that you've worked with? You've you've got some really good success with uh, some of the big brands. You want to talk about some of your clients? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, we're very lucky because we're you know one of the first ones out there. Um, you know, it's not PU or PVC. You know, like really, um, you know, an alternative made from natural fibers. Uh, obviously, everyone. I mean, you know, since 2016, 17. Um, you know, everyone has been really knocking at our door. I mean, we, we get, you know, hundreds of emails still today, every day, you know, to, to ask for more material, you know, and we'll see, you know, try to increase as much as possible, as quick as possible. Um, but yeah, very early on, we, we had really, um, you know, the chance to work with big names, such as, you know, Google Boss, um, you know, H&M and, um, you know, uh, Paul Smith last year um, to do footwear collections. Um, and also, um, you know, we've been very proud to have been selected by, you know, Hilton Hotels to, um, you know, they've created the first vegan suite in, in London, actually. It's in um, Hilton Bankside. And, you know, p has been used there throughout, you know, from the reception to the, you know, restaurant, you know, the specific seating area with, you know, chairs up also with p And then, of course, the street where, you know, the headboard and you know, chairs. And so, I mean, it's been the main star material and it's, it was so exciting to, you know, see that project um, uh, happening. And, and it will be rolled out in the future, you know, um, because there is a real demand for that. Yeah, totally. And um, you've just signed a, a, a large global uh, footwear brand. Um, it would be great to talk about, you know, how that's, you know, made a difference to your output uh, for, I think, last year, right? Uh, and this year. Yes. Um, and, and this is all we need, you know. Um, obviously, you always start with, you know, small limited editions to, you know, generate awareness, to to prove that you can use the material in all these applications. And, and that's a fantastic um, driver. Um, but obviously what's important for us now to grow is to, to have you know, larger contracts um, where straight from the beginning, you know, we have the larger volume and the commitment um, to, to work towards to, because that really triggers this, this um, positive value creation um, circle, let's say. You know, because once we get from a, you know, big name, a big order, so we can then have access to, you know, more depth facilities, and then we can immediately invest in increasing our production facility, uh, you know, hire more people, and, <clears throat> and then, you know, um, go on this kind of next level of, of, of um, uh, capabilities. And this is what exactly happened with this um, footwear order you know as soon as the order was in straight away you know within less than three months we have doubled our monthly production capacity have hired five more people in the philippines um and uh, and you know and this has projected us into you know at a different uh, level so um so that's very very exciting for us yeah that's awesome yeah and uh, it's definitely something that i want to see especially where the foot footwear companies trainers stroke sneaker companies replacing out um a lot of their animal waste leather with these alternatives and you know there's lots of innovation happening in this space and you know it's a key thing that we we need to try and encourage as consumers to do it for sustainability reasons for animal welfare uh you know for for emissions um so it's all it's all heavily linked isn't it uh, absolutely and and this is where 
I mean, really two things. I mean, first of all, we have understood as well from all this kind of learning process, we, you know, we're in a continuous improvement process. And over the last three to four years, um, you know, we've really understood how, how good Pinatex was actually for the footwear industry. It's, it's perfect for shoe applications. Um, and, and this is why we really now focus it on it as, as, as our main priority. And, um, and, and this is where we can create the biggest impact because, you know, as I said, you know, footwear is 50% of the current leather applications. And, you know, our ambition is that, um, you, know, you know, we will increase our, our production capacity over the next four or five years um, you know, to reach about, um, you know, 10 million uh, square meters um, in terms of production capacity. And um, out of that, we can, uh, you know, replace, um, you know, at least 1% of the current um, uh, leather shoe production. Um, so, you know, this is all by kind of, you know, um, growing um, with the help of these, you know, big brands also committing um, to, to you know, these larger orders. So, um, so that can go very fast. Another point that's um, really notable is that we are creating a portfolio of products where we can address all the needs of the footwear industry. Cut with Pinatex, um, the, the original version, with, which is perfect for, you know, lifestyle, um, uh, you know, trainers, like, you know, Hugo Boss made them, or Paul Smith, and, you know, you'll see that, uh, the future <laughs> uh, project that will be launched this summer. Um, but then we have, um, you know, another product line, which is called Pinatex Performance, that comes with a thicker, coating and as the name says um, it is really well suited to for more you know technical footwear and could be perfectly used for you know um, uh, walking shoes and you know um, uh, biking shoes hiking yeah, exactly. wearing, yeah. yeah more hard wearing shoes so yeah. that's one one area we go into right um, and, and by the way could that also be used for construction shoes you know the people in the construction industry yeah i mean anything anything can be can be you know experimented there and so, you know yeah. we, we're constantly you know we have you know constant r d uh, uh, flows um we work very closely with you know uk uh, academia and we have constantly you know grants and you know research projects to, to continue improving our product and you know, uh, create this this new opportunities and on the other spectrum, um, we also are currently on a very exciting project that we um, you know, explore with the University of Northampton in the UK um, to actually, you know, uh, you know, bring a finishing process of Pinatex in, in an actual tannery, you know, and to actually create a, a much more luxurious finish, which could thus, you know, open the doors to, to the luxury brands and like footwear and, and, and you know, luxury brands. So, so it's very exciting because you know our main priority is okay footwear, and we're just kind of now opening up more and more opportunities to touch more and more segments within that industry. Yeah, and I guess the next, you know, within um, footwear, then you've you know you've got your accessories such as you know obviously handbags and and belts and wallets and you know everything else which defines that luxury segment as well as as fashion. So. Uh, is that a key area that you want to explore? Um, and have you been doing trials around, say, say the handbags, for example? Yeah, I mean, currently, Pinatex is already used quite a lot in, in, in handbags and accessories. Um, but it's true that, um, you know, sometimes the, uh, say, the current touch and feel is, is really a, a signature touch and feel and look, you know, with this wrinkles and, uh, you know, so... So it's it's not necessarily um, you know fitting for what I would say currently the luxury industry is looking for because they look for really kind of absolutely leather like you know just very you know draped and and so you know we've been working on this to 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 reach that um, and we are on the path to to achieve that and this is why you know this kind of looking at a different way to finish it is actually a, a huge opportunity to 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 um, you know fit. Um, also what the client uh, is requesting. And you know, another underlying, I would say, um, achievement um, is also in terms of you know, our base material. And this is where you know, we continuously learn. And it's all about also you know, improving the way we do this substrate that is you know, made of pineapple and fiber. You have to mention, it's a really, it's a really 
um, strong fiber, yeah. uh, but actually by learning how to, you know, um, clean it better, you know, to make sure that there's no residue of leaves or, any, you know, other dirt or what. So the, you know, cleaning process is yeah. improved, but also the way it's, the fibers are cut, you know, that they're all cut in the same length. So then when it goes into the non-woven process, uh, yeah. what, what is that? Thing. Yeah. What is that uh, length um, that they're cut? Because you're only determined by the, the length of the leaf, obviously, uh, yeah. as well. So yeah. what is that? And then what is the process? Do you, do you have this, do you have to join them somehow? Or how, how does it work when you're creating these, yeah. you know, 20 meter length reels, I guess? <laughs> no, actually, so we, we, we are using a non-woven process. So how it works is that, you know, once the fibers are extracted, they're clean, they're purified. Um, you know, we use a, a very environmentally friendly enzymatic uh, formula for that. Um, so, you know, it's our own creation. And, um, and then it kind of goes, um, you know, um, a, a really classical, um, you know, non-woven process where the actual fibers are then opened and then they're blended with, um, you know, some um, corn-based PLA, which is also, you know, waste product, not from feedstock. And, and then they're kind of, you know, blended and then um, intertwined, let's say, in, the, in this non-woven process, which is, you know, you have this needle punching process that then kind of, um, you know, brings the fibers together in a very, um, you know, strong and, and sturdy um, fence. Um, and, and this is what makes the base of, of uh, Pinatex. Got it. Yeah, awesome. And um, in terms of, I guess, the um, there's some brands, uh, you know, that are going out that might be doing things around uh, making statements of like kind of like greenwashing, I guess that, that they're they're making these uh, products, but they're at the end of the day they're very limited products, and it's more used for like PR and marketing. Um, what are your thoughts around those brands that are doing that, mainly to try and capture segments of audience? Yes, I mean, globally speaking, it's it's always good to to try, and at least they're in the right direction. But then, um, you know, it's it's I would say it's a journey again. Yeah, of course, of course, it's frustrating to to see someone just you know um, uh, surfing on, on on this wave, and then kind of you know doing lots of claims and. But, but I think it, it works just to a certain extent and it probably just works in the short term because, you know, everyone, especially any consumers, um, you know, are getting, you know, educated and the younger generations, but also the older generations are really on it and they want to learn a lot and they ask plenty of questions. And, and I'd say us in the team, uh, we, we spend a good, I don't know, 10, 20 percent of our time, just constantly communicating, explaining and, and really sharing um, all the knowledge we have accumulated throughout our journey, also mm -hmm. the best practices and, you know, the do's and don'ts. So, so we spend a lot of time sharing, connecting um, and, and then also then kind of, you know, accompanying the brands who, you know, at least do this first step. Yeah, you start with a limited edition. Sure, I mean, you know, you have to experience the material as well, you know, you have to get used to it, it's, um, you know, maybe a different way of, you know, um, you know, using it, and there's a lot of experimentation at the beginning, and, and that's usually the first step, but then what's crucial, and this is where, you know, we are now also organized to do that, is to then get into the next step with the brand, say, great, you had a fantastic try um, it generated a lot of PR and you're very cool you know a green and so that's great but it's not enough now it's it's time to go the next step and actually to 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 come up with real commitments and say it's not just a limited edition we now actually going to really commit and say okay x percent of our um, you know um, leather purchase or you know, PU or PVC purchase we're actually going to replace it by an alternative material that is made from natural fibers, like Piatex, for instance. And then this is where really the, the exciting journey starts, because then um, there's this kind of, you know, I would say cross-pollinization between you know, the material company and the brand company, and they go on a journey together. 
Um, because again, you know, producing a, a sustainable product is, is obviously not just using Pinatex when you do a shoe, there are plenty of other materials going into that. So obviously for the brand, it's quite challenging because then suddenly there might be, I don't know, 20 components or what, or, you know, so they have to find um, alternative solutions for all of them. And, and this is where these kind of power of partnerships and creating an ecosystem where everyone has aligned interests is so powerful. And, and that will bring us further, all of us. Yeah. Yes. So it's really this, this partnership way of working. Yeah. That is so it, important. Is that something that you're, you're helping uh, to put forward, like this more, more of this uh, partnership approach, like, hey, you know, we know this other company that can create, you know, the insoles for you or, or you know, the, the mesh or, you know, recycled uh, uh, bottles, for example, for the fiber, et cetera, as well. Is that something that you're encouraging yourself? Uh, absolutely. And um, um, we, we're going to do that more and more um, as we grow, you know, and, yeah. and have more resources. Um, we, we will actually dedicate um, um, you know, a, a few people in the team doing just that. So first of all, our first ambassador is obviously Carmen, our founder. Um, who, you know, is obviously now relieved from all the, you know, operational um, side and, you know, um, I'm there to deal with that. So she can now really kind of get out and, you know, beyond Pinatex and beyond just, you know, the um, uh, business aspects, um, really, um, you know, meet cross industry and, uh, you know, sustainability icons and really kind of spread the word in this way of thinking, this way of, you know, working together. Yeah. And then um, we, we also work a lot with, I mean, I said academia, research, uh, but also with students. Uh, we really strongly believe in, you know, the power of, you know, helping students because they're the designers and the managers and the, the buyers of tomorrow. Yes. And we've already seen just in, in the last three years where I've been there, I've already seen, you know, some of the students we, we had and, um, you know, supported um, three years ago, they're now, um, you know, buyers or, you know, uh, designers in brands and they contact us now That's and okay. say, now I can work with you because yeah, now, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm part of this decision-making process and yes. I can influence from within, which is a fantastic thing. And lastly, um, where we also, you know, um, we have really the, the wish again to, to um, unite um, the different um, material solutions that are out there, because again, we, we don't consider the others as competitors. I mean, the market is huge. Yeah, it's yeah. huge to us to replace leather in the yeah. future. So there's space for everyone. And I think what we'd like to do is really um, connect more with the others to explain to the end consumer, but also to the brands, how do we position ourselves? And, you know, because we all, you know, bring a solution and, we're all more or less complementary. And it's very important that we kind of create this kind of unity um, to, to bring transparency, to bring knowledge, to bring, you know, this, um, you know, positioning of the solutions. And so we've started that. And, um, and Carmen, actually our founder, she's one of the founding members of a, a trade association called the Fiber Association. So it's going to be launched in, in, in the next few weeks. Very exciting. Awesome. Um, yeah. With a few other uh, founding members. So I won't say more for now, but the, that will come out very soon. Um, where we join forces with complementary natural fiber material solutions and, and really kind of, you know, um, speak in one united voice um, to open up to everyone else. Yeah. So I guess, you know, when you're looking at the other companies and, and alternatives, you've got, you know, um, uh, things like uh, byproducts of like grape, the grape leather, for example, from the grape skin, you've got cactus leather, you've got now mushrooms as well. Uh, what's your opinion about those, um, those products, but more so, I guess, if you're saying it's complementary, specific uses of their products versus yours? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, those who use, um, I would say, um, 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 you know, a backing like a microfiber backing or a cotton backing or even a PU backing, 
and where the actual you know um, uh, content of the you know natural content is is still relatively low. I'd say they're the closest probably to the you know um, current PU offer, but just kind of marginally um, um, uh, better from an environmental point of view. Um, and they obviously, as they are so close to what already exists, obviously they, they are usually positioning quite well in, in use for um, you know, accessory applications or bags, uh, because they're still looking at this you know, drape. And, and that you can only achieve with this kind of you know, really um, larger PU content. But but it's you know it's it's a progression and you know our, our choice is is to be you know made of you know ninety five percent of natural fiber waste material, and and that comes obviously with with challenges in terms of kind of you know material properties and haptic and how it's you know um, how how it, you know is used in, in combination with with other materials um, that makes obviously the journey harder but but the impact is bigger. Yes. You know? So. It is more rewarding, and you know, it's just a matter of you know brands getting to that and just kind of getting this understanding, but also consumer behavior changing. That actually is, you know, um, uh, is yeah, I actually get you know, um, yeah, get used to it, and, and and we are improving at the same time. It's a, it's a parallel journey to just kind of you know, join this win-win um, collaboration. So um, one of the things in the in the process of you extracting the fibers is that you're left with this uh, green uh, component from, from the leaves. And, and that can, I was happy to hear that that could be used for natural fertilizer. Um, and it can also be used as biogas, which, which is quite amazing as well. Absolutely. So we're totally in the you know, circular economy yeah. model. And um, yes. so we're using waste and then we're even you know, generating a, a, a waste that is, you know, a, valorized as well so so nothing is left yes indeed so when you extract fibers from the leaves um, the rest is just given you know, this green biomass uh, that remains and it's it's a perfect um, you know perfect use as then you know fertilizers you, know, you can use it to compost uh, and at huge volumes um, you can actually then use it to to create biogas and obviously our project is that as we scale in, in, in volume is that our you know our you know the factory in the Philippines and you know we're gonna um, have um, other you know partnerships in the very near future in other parts of the world that wherever we generate these um, huge amounts of biomass it would actually then be um, you know used as bioenergy to actually you know um, provide the energy for our own operations, which yeah. you know, brings us to this journey of not only carbon neutral, but at some point being also carbon negative. That's right. So, yeah, my other favorite topic is around energy and um, especially within the automotive industry. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, as, as we look at the market now and uh, car companies springing up, whether they're just EV companies or traditional car companies are looking heavily in those models to do with sustainability and making their choices for the materials, which they've been doing for a while now. Um, do you also see that as a key segment for you, for, for your customer base, the, the automotive industry? Absolutely. And, you know, actually, after obviously fashion, um, you know, footwear and priority and bags and accessories, um, our second big priority is, is automotive uh, industry. And we actually have signed a, a joint development agreement uh, with a tier one uh, manufacturer last year. And um, we're now in the final stages to um, you know, validate um, uh, you know, prototypes. And, um, and yeah, I mean, that has, you know, there's a big you know, project ahead uh, once that you know, material has been signed off um, to then go into a uh, you know, commercial phase where you know, we would then be looking at very high figures and then you know, looking more specifically at the you know, electric vehicle market. Yeah, I mean, the projection is to, to again, you know, to be, you know, target at least 1% of the electric vehicle market by 25 to, to be equipped as PX. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And 
I guess you've also got, um, you know, the, the other energy sources like hydrogen fuel cell cars and, and, and lorries and vans and all that is a huge opportunity, I think, in terms of commercial fleets as well. Yes, I mean, at the moment, um, of course, we, we, we're very appealing to, to all the electric vehicle solutions or the, you know, other, and, and obviously you start always with premium brands, premium OEMs, because, you know, this is where, you know, you have the full concept and, um, and the right platform to really also explain, um, you know, all these different materials. Because not to forget, I mean, up to now, um, no one was really either caring or talking about what material, you know, has been used inside your car. I mean, no, no one would use that as part of their decision-making process when you purchase a car. But you, know, these new, um, I would say, um, you know, electric vehicle brands, they, they bring this kind of awareness and, and this transparency about actually what materials are we actually using inside the car. And, and this is where it gets really exciting because everyone can tell their story and explain the, the impact they, they, they contribute to that um, uh, product. Um, so that will kind of then, I think, trickle down um, to, to the main uh, you know, usage and to, you know, um, mainstream um, automotive market. And then once it's picked up there, and then that means also that we have reached the scale in terms of production, uh, but also costs, yeah? Um, then it becomes a really, really relevant and significant journey because then you create impact at scale. And it's all about that, right? Yeah. Um, so talking about sort of cost then, um, how, how does it compare today? Um, you know, you speak a lot about, you know, um, 2025 uh, being a point of, of reference for you. How do you think uh, the price will change from now to, to that sort of time period? Yeah, I mean, it will be quite significant um, because, you know, as um, um, you know, there are two, currently are two main um, cost factors. Uh, on one side is the, um, you know, extraction of, of pineapple leaf fiber. And, um, and the second one is the is actually the finishing costs. So how do we address these? I mean, the fiber extraction cost is, is you know, we will have several sites in the world and we're currently working on onboarding five new um, fiber suppliers in, you know, um, you know, we started in the Philippines, but now we're talking with, you know, um, Bangladesh, um, Indian Ocean, uh, Costa Rica, and in Africa. Um, so we will have more diverse and larger sources of fiber supply um, that will go live already this year. And so that will already kind of help to, you know, um, reduce the cost of the you know, shipment as well, but also kind of um, um, just the sheer volume will help to, to decrease um, the cost. Um, and then second, in terms of finishing, these are purely economies of scale, yeah? So um, it's, it's just not the same price if you finish a batch of 1,000 meters or 10,000 meters, right? So, so this is where then the cost goes down very, very quickly. And, you know, again, if we go into these kind of larger orders and, you know, we can, you know, plan ahead and, you know, if more secure forecasting, um, then it's, it's a no-brainer, then costs go down very fast. So, you know, we can, you know, we have cost projections that are kind of also adjusted and we work on, for instance, with the um, tier one manufacturing, the automotive industry, because that's, I would say, the main challenge in terms of cost, yeah? And mm -hmm. we have a really a, a roadmap for, you know, the next three years, how we're actually going to achieve um, uh, a price that fits the automotive industry, but without compromising, of course, um, of course you know, yeah. the, um, um, the, the, the price we pay to the farmers and you know, throughout the manufacturing process. So right. you can find these win-win solutions if you work together straight from the beginning on the big picture. Yeah, very nice. Um, and let, let's talk a little bit now about your, your background and um, you know, how you've transitioned from a very corporate career to, to now being uh, working in a very entrepreneurial uh, uh, venture that you're doing with um, Pintex and yeah. Yes, yeah. So 
uh, yeah, I started, um, you know, with 10 years uh, in, in a corporate um, uh, uh, company. I worked at uh, you know, LVMH in the, in the luxury industry in, in, in perfume and cosmetics. Uh, it was a wonderful journey. Uh, absolutely loved it. And I'm still a big fan of, you know, it's the brand Guerlain. So I still use their products and, you know, we remain fan for, forever because they are the most beautiful products you could imagine in the, in the cosmetic and perfume industry. Um, but, but, you know, while I was there, um, during my, my, my 10 years um, at Guerlain, I had um, at some point the opportunity to work on a, on a very entrepreneurial project, which is actually the spa business. Um, and um, it was, you know, kind of a separate team, um, but was, you know, using all the infrastructure and, you know, the setup of, of a big corporate company. And, and, you know, we were a very agile um, team and, um, and I, I love this. It really kind of um, triggered this, this feeling of, you know, actually, I love this idea of, you know, creating something from scratch and then growing it and, and you know, and so kind of revealed this entrepreneurship, uh, um, you know, passion in, in me. And then, um, you know, and then a few years later, um, said, okay, let's just give it a go. Um, so I, I decided to completely change life. I uh, said goodbye to, <laughs> to my corporate career and said, okay, um, I, will, I will actually set up my own um, venture. And, um, and my second passion is actually food. So, and I was always kind of, you know, having, you know, two children. And then um, back then they were quite young and, you know, trying to juggle work and children and everything. I was saying, how can we, can we find a solution where you can actually still, you know, cook really nice and healthy food, uh, you know, when you come back in the evening, but have no time to go shopping and no time to, you know, do lots of veg chopping and, you know, preparation. So it would be great to have, you know, when you go into the tube uh, out of work, if someone could give you a bag with all the ingredients in it to actually, you know, cook it at home. And I said, actually, I'm just going to create just that. So I created my little venture called Pick and Cook, and, and that was really the beginning of this entrepreneurial journey. Um, my key learning of that, although it was, you know, a successful pop-up store, uh, did it in London Tube Station, um, my, my big kind of key learning of that was, um, you know, you, you can be very lonely when, when you're kind of on your entrepreneurial journey, and, and clearly um, I was missing the, the, you know, the power of the team. And, and then also actually, you know, the kind of, uh, let's say the, the, um, the financial situation was where I was not in a position back then to, to invest more, you know, I had two you know, young children were kind of, you know, at some point was not the right moment in my life. But then actually I found the right compromise by actually working with, um, you know, um, startups or SMEs um, by actually positioning myself as the one helping them on a consultancy basis to, you know, to, to, to structure themselves, to, to, to grow further. Um, and by combining, obviously, my, you know, experience from, you know, big corporate setup, really professionally run, uh, but also with the empathy um, of, you know, what, what an entrepreneur goes through, because I had experienced it myself. And I, I think, you know, this combination um, obviously opened a lot of doors and, and is quite powerful. And, um, and so that kind of led me, you know, to, you know, to work with different uh, business owners. And I learned so much, you know, I went into the you know, textile uh, design, I went into the, um, uh, you know, alcohol industry, uh, you know, whiskey uh, brands, and uh, yeah, had a fantastic time there. Uh, and each experience kind of brought me these kind of building blocks of, you know, working with Asia, working with, um, you know, um, uh, industrial setups and so on, that literally somehow prepared me for, for now, you know, um, joining uh, Anas and I'm three years ago. And, and as always, you know, sometimes, you know, things happen just by chance. And um, it turns out, you know, I, I met, um, you know, the, the CFO of Ananas and uh, we're actually alumni of the same university. And we met at a, you know, alumni event where we both talked with a panel to students about our entrepreneurial experience. And, and this is kind of how we, you know, connected. And that was really the time when, you know, three years ago, Carmel founder 
um, you wanted to, you know, kind of leave the, the operational side of the business, but just concentrate more, you know, or, you know, her own projects, you know, and kind of you know, continuing building sustainability and the design projects, innovation. And actually, they were looking for someone to then now run uh, an SNM, but more important than to scale it, you know, to 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 just you know uh, be able to cope with the demand that was you know increasing every day. So this is where I joined, and then you know everything came together as you know a jigsaw that was kind of then finished. It's like you know all this journey suddenly made so much sense because now I, I use all of these skills and assets learned before. Um, uh, I use them now every day and 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 grow every day. So, so yeah. yes. So let, let's uh, let's talk about one of the the skills there you mentioned before um, around um, EQ or, or emotional intelligence. Um, how how powerful do you think that is to have in a in a business environment? Yes, it's 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 crucial, and it it really starts with um, um, you know with taking the time to listen, taking the time to understand, um, and, and really um, you know, project yourself in, in the position of the other one. Um, and I'd say, especially for Anas Anam, you know, um, you know, Anam it, you know, needs care. And, um, and you know, we care about the world, we care about you know, the planet, we care about um, uh, people um, and, and all our stakeholders. And, and I think this is why we've been also B Corp certified because it's in our very own DNA, you know? So it's just kind of a third party acknowledgement of what we've always been. And, and I think, you know, if, if you combine that in the, the understanding and the respect of all the cultural aspects as well, so you have to imagine we, we export to over almost 90 countries and our supply chain spans from, you know, we talk as well to, you know, farmers in the Philippines, you know, as well to, you know, um, CEOs of big corporate companies. So we have the ability, I'd say, to, to switch from, you know, one to the other. And we're probably one of the only ones who are able to connect all these people within one big story. And, and I'd say, yes, that requires a lot of, um, I would say, people skills, but but from everyone in the team, you know, respect, um, um, care, uh, but also the perseverance and, and really kind of um, always be very, you know, honest and transparent and very clear of what we want to achieve. Um, and that's what, you know, the journey we, we, we take everyone into comes also with a lot of expectations um, that we, you know, place to the others because, um, our expectations, to be honest, is that you know you have to be transparent. You have to you know comply with you know environmental and social KPIs that we're setting up, um, and and um, you know and to work together on this with this kind of joint win-win um, spirit. Yeah, and um, it's fantastic that you're uh, a woman in a leadership uh, position. Uh, how can we encourage more women to be, uh, especially moving into the, a board level position uh, and especially with some of the existing companies, but also encourage more women to start their own enterprises? Yes, so there are many, many ways. I'd say, first of all, to, to women, it's, it's just, first of all, to, to start, stop doubting about everything and just to go for it, yeah? And, and I'd say one rule, always say yes to a new opportunity and don't think too much about whether you can do it or not. No, just go for it. And then you figure out later. Um, and, um, and really to, I would say, open up um, to all sorts of, you know, creating new opportunities as well in terms of, you know, expanding your network uh, and also, um, you know, you can start very easily with uh, pro bono work where you could, for instance, you know, join, um, you know, a board of a charity um, uh, or you could, you know, mentor or coach, um, you know, students or, you know, um, other people in your um, sector where, you know, they're kind of uh, juniors and you can kind of, you know, help them to go towards this next objective, this next step in their career. Um, and um, yeah, and then also, um, you know, what 
you know, also advising um, uh, startups, you know, I think a lot of people who reach kind of a certain level in their, in their corporate career um, very often feel either bored or a bit frustrated because they feel kind of stuck in their, in their specialty or you know, in their setup. But there's so much you can do just kind of out of working hours and, and just kind of reach out to all these, you know, fantastic startups that are there. You can never give enough help and, and all these kind of more senior experts, they're so, I mean, every startup is so grateful for any support and advice you can get. So, and this is where as a woman, you can very well start to reach out. And this is where then the magic happens, because if you reach out without any specific expectations, but just for the sheer you know, pleasure of sharing, um, uh, then very often, you know, new opportunities arise and then new doors open. And, and, and this is when they're, you know, you, you, you feel more comfortable to, to, to you know, uh, be in a more senior setup or in a board level. Um, and and then, then it happens, you know, but, but you have to clearly do this first step yourself and just you know, trust yourself and, and just don't hesitate to put yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone. And the more you do it, the more you get used to it and the more, you know, exciting and rewarding it is when it actually, you know, leads to somewhere. Yeah. That's, that's great advice. Um, so just lastly, when, when, we, when we're looking at the, the, the global market and we're looking at the big institutions, the big financial institutions, um, making uh, big goals around ESG uh, and making sure that um, the finance companies, like, whether it's BlackRock or I know Goldman Sachs, are creating funds or picking stocks that have high high goals around sustainability and then um, organizations making their own sustainable goals. And I'm seeing now also um, executive teams being accountable um, as part of their pay package to make sure that their supply chain and everything they're doing has the same company level goals. How important is that to drive this innovation that you know, is going on, on right now where we need to care, care more for the planet. That's, that's a fantastic development, first of all. And, um, and clearly there, there's, there's a lot of money out there um, to, be, to be taken. And the whole, I would say, challenge now is to direct this money to the right solutions. And, um, and this is where, you know, you have to navigate this, this big crowd of, you know, institutional, you know, uh, investors. And then, you know, there, there are plenty of, of um, you know, uh, investors out there. And um, I mean, for us, uh, for our journey, um, you know, um, investors, our shareholders play a really important role. Uh, in, in our development um, and uh, you know this year we are um, heading towards our, our series B fundraising and um, because it's getting you know quite substantial now um, you know we, we we're getting advice um, to reach now you know beyond the VC stage but also to reach investors of I would say a larger scale more institutional um, investors. Yes. Um, that will, um, you know, help us to, you know, um, you know, put us on this path of, of becoming global solution. And, um, and, you know, I'd say all this is currently accelerating a lot and um, there are really a lot of opportunities. And I think it's, uh, this is money well invested. And, um, you know, and, you know, I think certification, like for instance, like B Corp, um, is certainly helping a lot um, investors to to you know to assess a company where they get kind of a I would say first seal of guarantee that that a given company is fulfilling um, you know um, ESG criteria um, and because I think this is where investors also need some um, assessment tools and there are not really yet some you know. Um, uh, global assessment tools that fit for or fit all purposes. And, and I would say B Corp is one of them. And, and clearly that opens a lot of doors to us because investors know that half of the due diligence work is already done yeah, through the certification. So, right. so that helps a lot. Um, yeah, so um, 
seeing huge opportunities there. So look forward to it. <laughs> great, great. So, um, yes, yeah, so thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been uh, a pleasure to speak to you today and I wish you the best of luck with your Series B that's coming up. Uh, I definitely want to see um, your product in, in more cases and hopefully with, with uh, some new trainers that I might buy or in, in cars that I might see in. <laughs> so, yeah, and, uh, and wallets and bags and everything. So there's a huge opportunity for you. So, yeah, just want to thank you for all the work that you're doing as well. Thank you so much, Anand, for, for having me and uh, for your fantastic show. A huge fan. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.